This is Duke University. So I think one of the uh, biggest challenges for humans is actually to deal with randomness, what we, what we think about noise, right? Noise is, is basically a signal that is distributed evenly. And we have a very hard time learning about that. So think about what, what creates good conditions for human learnings. Uh, basketball is an example. You sit there and you throw the basket and you throw the ball and you get immediate feedback on every time. You try different versions of how you're going to throw the ball. You get immediate precise feedback about how, how well you did. But if you think about life more generally, very few things in life create immediate precise feedback. Uh, you do homework, it takes a few weeks until you get your uh, feedback uh, about how we did. Not only that, but there's randomness in the uh, error process. You invest in the stock market, it takes a while to see what happens. Not only that, there's lots of feedback in it. You go on a diet. You don't eat much one day. The feedback of when it's actually going to kick in is going to be delayed and going to have a big stochastic element, a big random element. So I, I think for me, how people deal with randomness is incredibly uh, important, and we do a really bad job. That's, by the way, why I believe people have superstitions. Right? You're a baseball player, you didn't change your underwear two times, things worked well, you say it must be that. Right? That's the rule, a deterministic rule. We don't do well with things that have random components because when we infer things, we try to infer a deterministic rule. Now, what's happening is that in the noise, there's some signals that are uh, available in principle, but they're available to statistical software and not much to human beings. The moment we look at a big set of data and we try to impose deterministic rules on that data, we end up missing the essence of what's, what's going on. So for me, that's actually a good, a good metaphor to think about. Here is something that we just miss when we look at data. Computers are really good at that. We pick patterns that don't really exist. We're really good at picking patterns, but we're really good at picking patterns that don't really exist. It's interesting. And, I, and to tie this to literature, I think uh, I agree with that about superstition. And I also think that sometimes storytelling is about trying to find a pattern to all the randomness of life. Right? There's certain plots that recur over and over again. That's why we tell children fairy tales or stories, bedtime stories. And why kids might even want to hear those stories over and over and over again, it does seem to make the world more rational and coherent. It's nice to think of ourselves as having a plot when we know that everyday life is a lot crazier than that. Um, I have a, I'm going to tell a story, actually, because um, your example of the basketball and the immediate feedback reminded me of an incident in my own life when several years ago I was in a, a big accident and basically um, had to have an arm replaced. And I would sit in the therapy pool with people who would tell me over and over, oh, th physical therapy doesn't work. And I'd say, oh, really? And they'd say, yeah, this is the third time I've had this operation, and I don't do the physical therapy. It never works. And I think, well, wait. Maybe you're having the operation three times because you're not doing the physical therapy. And there was one elderly man in his 70s who said to me, actually, you know what you need to do is you don't need to hang around with those people in the pool who aren't doing rehab. You need to come between 4.30 and 5.30 every day to sports rehab. Because that's when the, in, the, in the night, no, no, <laughs> in the afternoon. It's when the basketball players were there, the Duke basketball players were, re, were practicing with the, either re, rehabbing themselves or learning how to be better. Because they were getting constant positive feedback about everything they did. There was one player who shall remain nameless who was learning how to jump higher. And it was great because they had this stick with a little flag on the top. and he would run and jump and get the flag, and they'd say, oh, that's pretty good. And he'd turn his back and walk away, and they would put the flag intentionally higher than he could reach. I would be able to see this, but he didn't know this, so that when he would come to jump again, he wouldn't, make, he wouldn't get it, and they, they'd say, wow, you sure didn't do well that time. And he had no idea that they were manipulating him. But I could see this, but it was also clear that he was jumping higher. So it was like, suddenly I had a metric for, if I do this boring, really boring work. It was eight hours, it was, you know, several hours a day, every single day. It will lead to something. But that was very artificially imposed. You know, it was watching somebody improve to trick myself into believing that if I did this, I would improve too. And I think that's really a lot about storytelling. The kind of stories not only we read, but the stories we tell ourselves in order to motivate ourselves. Um, one more comment about artificial intelligence. So, uh, 
when your artificial intelligence is kind of two approaches, is let's call the, the strong artificial intelligence and the weak artificial intelligence. The, the strong artificial intelligence basically said, let's use systems that do things better than human beings. And we don't care about what people are doing, computers can do things better. And with statistical reasoning and error term and randomness, I think computers can do it quite easily. Then there's the weak uh, artificial intelligence approach. And in that approach, what we say is people are really amazing in a few things. Vision, for example, right? Let's look at how people do it, and let's try to create a computer system that mimics what people do, right? And that's, a, that's an interesting approach. And when you think about how people do things, rule-based approach, approaches are really very much like we do things. We're storytellers, right? We're trying to find out rules about what happens. And on the cases when rules happen to be a good fit, it's really a good approach to do it. On the cases when rules don't fit very well, rule-based systems basically break, break down. But it's actually very interesting how much of life we're trying to organize as if it's rules. Uh, one of the things we do is segmentation. We say, oh, women are different than men. Generation X is different, generation Z is different, generation Y. The reality is that when we do studies, we don't find that many differences. You all think you're very different than your parents. You're actually much more similar. You know, from 100% variance, there's much more similarity than difference. Uh, but we actually don't see that similarity. We don't see how uh, similar things are because we have this attention to try and get rules based that differentiate things that we think are different. Okay. So we'll move on to the next question. This is um, from RTA Peter and it says, however simplistic art is thinking in images reminds us of the relationship between the figuration of ideas and the ideas of those figurations. Shklovsky, not sure how to say that exactly, advances the image from a bearer of symbols and ideas to a provocateur of impressions and abstractions. On a similar note, Chomsky points out how infants look for the rhythmic structures in early development. Does art ask us to reconsider abstractions and noise? If so, what role does art play in expanding attention? It's very interesting because even, um, I think it's in, in one of the um, articles we read, we talked about how even when we think we're being abstract, people will read patterns or see patterns make patterns, try to, uh, the figure in the carpet, to use Henry James's phrase, or trying to find some kind of a pattern in wood grain, as if it, as if it um, re reflects a, a real thing. Um, the way we fill in is fascinating. We saw that in the article um, about uh, uh, change blindness, uh, how very, a little bit of data will conjure up past experience or other ideas and we will fill in that data and make what is abstract or sketchy suddenly seem much more solid. It's a, it seems to be something that's akin to superstition or storytelling uh, in the way we see the world. Um, the issue of art and what art does is very interesting because I think partly um, one plot that we see over and over in, in art and both Simmel and Vygotsky talked about this in different ways, is that which is strange, literally the stranger, or, a, or something in a plot, the surprise in a plot, that which is strange makes us re-understand that which is common or familiar. Uh, culture, culture shock is a similar one, right? where you go into a different, uh, any human goes into a culture and you think you know what the world is like and suddenly you start seeing all kinds of things that seem different from the way you're doing them and then you have to go back and re-examine your own life. That's one function of narrative art and often of um, certain kinds of Dadaistic art. Uh, Dada being like the fur in the teacup, the juxtaposition of things that don't go together precisely because that defamiliarizes us. That makes us wary, makes us pay attention in a different way. It surprises us. And as soon as a, an, an artist has managed to catch, um, uh, to make a surprise, they kind of have us. They have our attention. Um, they also probably can mislead us in good ways when that's the case, right? And a story or a movie, uh, suddenly once, they, once you have attention in a certain way, we're very um, prone to fill in with our own fears. Um, an example is um, one of the things we read today, uh, we watched today was the video, uh, the final, pro, uh, final cut 
10 by 10, <coughs> 10 uh, cutting software video, the tutorial, and it was just of somebody walking up and opening a door. And the tutorial showed us different ways that somebody could go and open a door. And I immediately started thinking of all the horror movies where someone opens a door, right? All it would need is a little bit of time, a little difference in timing, a little more jagged cutting from the whole person to the hand, right? Or the door slowly opening and maybe cutting to some graphic images, scary graphic images, or music, right? Or maybe oversaturated color. And we'd be convinced something terrifying was happening before anything did. And I think that's one function of art is to um, take what seems to be abstract, opening the door, and flood it with all kinds of uh, images that almost make us tell the story before the, right, the art, artist tells the story themselves. Uh, we're already creating the plot uh, before, it's, before it's being created on us. Um, we're the stranger in that sense, in similar sense. Um, okay. so, so, so I think that, uh, for me, attentional blindness is about the fact that we see with our brains rather than our eyes. We think that we see with our eyes, but we actually see with our brains. And it also means something about human laziness. Right? It basically means that we have an idea of what we're going to see, and we don't really re-examine this idea. We just say, whatever we think we'll see, we'll see, and we'll basically accommodate the world as uh, to, to what we think. And if I think about the, the role of of art in this, I think you can think about two ways uh, to conceptualize it. One is, you go about your life and you keep on expecting to see something else, and the question is, what would stop you and make you pay attention? Right? So it's not giving you a different reality, but it's the same reality, but what would give you enough stir to start imposing your view on the world? What would stop you and get you to re-examine what it is that you're you're watching. That's one, one approach. And the second approach is to take you down a different path. It's not about getting you to just kind of, uh, you know, frighten you and get you to, to start seeing differently, but it's about taking you on a different path that you might have not uh, seen before. And, um, you know, Kathy talked about her uh, injury, and you know, I think injuries are uh, an example where life takes a very different a path and all of a sudden you can observe very different things. So I, I also had a, an injury and, and the thing for me was that I, for many years I was, I was in bed, I, I did lots of things that I wouldn't have done otherwise. I'll give you just one example. So for quite a few months I was fed by a tube. I had a tube through my nose and they would feed me. I, I ate 30 eggs a day and 7,000 calories, not eight, I mean they pushed into me. Um, <laughs> This was all to, to get enough energy to recover after burns. Um, and then after a few months, they took it off and they asked me to eat. And you know what? Eating seems so strange all of a sudden. Like chewing? Who came up with it? Like it seemed, it seemed aversive, right? After months and months and months of just getting a tube and six times a day, a machine starts working and pushing substance into it, all of a sudden the idea of and you know, I thought, I thought, like, what would I enjoy eating? And I said, can I have strawberries and whipped cream? And they said, well, you know, we can't really give you strawberries. We just want to give you high fat stuff. Well, how about just whipped cream? <laughs> I said, okay, you know, that sounds reasonable. You know what? It's just unpleasant. <laughs> and you know, you never think of this. Like, when was the last time you thought about how much you enjoy chewing, right? It just seems reasonable. And there's a million things like it. That once you don't do them for a while, everything all of a sudden become quite strange. Now this is a, you know, if you take a big turn in your own life and you experience something very different, all of a sudden you can reflect on it. But I think that art can give us some uh, insights like that. Here's an alternative reality for life. Here is what it would look from that perspective. And then this is it. here's how it looks. And that gives you a contrast to reevaluate what, what you're doing. Think about it on all kinds of things you're doing, right? Where are the where did you get your rituals of dating and doing homework and what you decide to do an email and how you talk to your parents, right? If you took enough step out of that and all of a sudden you reevaluated as if you came from Mars, you would probably look quite, quite strange. And I was at some conference last week and somebody said, if you came, actually it was at YouTube, and somebody said, if you came as a margin to Earth, you would say, what do people do on Earth? 
they film and document their mating rituals. <laughs> and then they're really afraid that they will forget about it. So they put it online and then they go back to see it all the time. Right? It's kind of amazing to think about how much is that describing human behavior. Excellent. This is a question that comes from one of our students who uses the pseudonym Abu. Uh, one of the comments in the article by uh, Harvard Business Review user Mustafa Dara pointed out that if people hadn't been told to count the tosses and just watch the video, they would have probably seen the gorilla quite clearly. This leads me to ask the professors, when educating, is it best to first show information and let students make their own conclusions and then assign them tasks on the information, i.e. watch the video first with no assignment? then count the tosses the second time around. Do we currently do this in education? Well, the simple thing is if you aren't told to caught, toss, uh, count the tosses, you always see the gorilla. And um, in the Harvard Business Review version of that, I told a shorter version. I just said I was dyslexic, so I didn't count, which is true. But it was also situational. I was involved in arranging the dinner uh, for the provost's office when I was a vice provost, at which we were showing that video. So I thought. Well, first of all, it's going to be hard for me to count. And second, I have to worry about the caterer. Has President Broadhead gotten here yet? Is everyone seated? I was in charge of the event, so I wasn't watching the video. And it's weird when you see the gorilla video for the first time and you realize you missed the gorilla. It's a lot weirder to be in a room full of all these fancy Duke professors and you're seeing the gorilla and you're looking around and nobody else is seeing the gorilla, right? And that, to me, is a huge lesson. And that's the learning part, I'm really glad that that was tied to learning, because one learning lesson of that to me is if you're in a room and everybody's saying there's no gorilla, and there's one crazy person who says, wait, 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 there's a gorilla in that video, don't automatically assume that the person who says there's a gorilla in the basketball video is a nutcase. Right? You know, in other words, that's, that's probably, partly what I was getting at, is one part of learning is being able to listen to the dissonant the strange, the artistic, the creative, the unexpected voice, the thing that doesn't fit in, and being able to be attuned to information you might be able to get from that source that isn't seeing from the same perspective that you're seeing. In terms of learning and pedagogy, I personally think that the, um, if you spoon feed somebody an interpretation, you're robbing them that they will, that's, that's like counting the basketballs. You, if you tell somebody in advance how to understand uh, an assignment, they will tend, if you're an authority figure, they will tend to see that explanation of the assignment. And one of the reasons I love having people blog um, by themselves or in reading each other's blogs but, and blogging publicly, but before we've talked about the phenomena, uh, is precisely because everybody was digesting it in different ways. It was fascinating to go back and read and see how you took five or six really different readings and found connections, but not the same connections. If we had made the connections first, it would have been hard to see anything but those connections. Right? You, would have had to be, you would have had to overcome knowledge in order to see some other connection. But you had the advantage of seeing 30 people make different kinds of connections between pretty disparate work. That to me is really rich, and that to me models how you can learn despite attention blindness. Because you basically got to see 30 different people interpreting the same, you all had the same experience, right? You all read the same reading, but you interpreted them and committed to an interpretation of them in basically 30 different ways. And there was a lot of variation in, in what people chose to make connections by. So th that for me is the methodology of, of attention blindness applied to learning. Uh, so, um, when I, when I show the gorilla movie or one of those things, I said the gorilla movie, I tell people count the number of people, the, people, the time, people in the white t-shirts count the ball to each other. And then I say, just realize that there's been many, many studies showing that people who've done well on this task live longer <laughs> and have better job promotion. <laughs> and then I say, on top of it, when the 30 seconds are over, I'll ask you to tell me aloud how many hands you saw pass. And if you get it wrong, the people sitting next to you will think you're incompetent. Uh -uh. So I basically try to elevate the attention, right? Because who wants the people sitting next to them to think they're incompetent? And you see a big shift in the percentage of people who don't see the gorilla, right? So it is about 
paying attention. And the more attention you're paying to one thing, the less attention you pay to the other thing. That's, that's kind of the basic, the basic story. In terms of education, I think there are some things in which education is about what you should pay attention to. And I think in that case, we have a duty to help students to figure out what to pay attention to. So the field of decision making in general uh, has shown that individual differences matter much less than the differences in the environment, right? If I put you in a different line in the cafeteria, you'll eat very differently, right? If I tell you things about dieting, it will not matter so much. So in, in a case in which you can focus on individual differences, or you can focus on environmental differences, I would like not to let you decide for yourself which one is right and which one is wrong, but to help you pay attention to the things that we have found out over time make a bigger difference. But there's this other point about overforcing a framework. And I'll tell you one story about this. So this was maybe my third or fourth year as a professor, an assistant professor or associate. And, and I'm teaching in a class of executives. And I'm teaching them introduction to marketing. These are people who are all worked for many years. Uh, I was teaching at the time at MIT. They came for a year program, very prestige program. They're paying a lot of money. And they're telling me that they want frameworks. And I said, don't worry about frameworks. Let's just learn the material. And they keep on telling me they want frameworks. They want frameworks, like, you know, a two by two or some box and arrows. And I try to refuse. And then they, I get the midterm evaluation, and they hammer me. They are my customers. They want frameworks. They need frameworks. Where are the frameworks? I come to class the day after the midterm evaluations, and I say, you know what? I listen. You told me you want framework. Today, we're going to do frameworks. Finally, they take their pencils out. They're all ready. And I say, in marketing, there are two important frameworks, the FN framework and the LN framework. And the FN framework has three components. The first one is design. Why is design important? People raise their hand. They participate. Adoption, adoption of products, why is that important? People raise their hand, participate, and new products. Very good. We covered the first framework. Then we move to the LN framework. And this one is more complex, it has six components. Attitude, research, image, education, learning, and finally, yield. And this takes about 45 minutes, maybe half an hour. We talk about all the nuances, why, why is each of those elements so important, and so on. Everybody's really happy, like the energy in the room is fantastic, right? We finally learned something, there are frameworks. And then I tell them that like all good frameworks, these frameworks also have acronyms, because that's a crucial thing, right? So the FN framework is design, adoption, new product, D-A-N. <laughs> and the LN framework is attitude, research, image, education, <laughs> learning, yield. Anyway, FN is first name, LN is last name, so they spell my name. <laughs> And the students were pissed off. <laughs> it was, I got the worst uh, ratings I ever got for a class. And they had no sense of humor, clearly. But <laughs> here's the thing. At the end of the semester, the students had to submit papers and to uh, analyze some problems. And three of the groups used the FNLN framework. <laughs> and they said, you, we know you made fun of us, but it's helpful. <laughs> And I think that's kind of the danger, right? You can create a framework that is basically, it took you five minutes and constrained by your name. And if people start thinking about the world from that perspective, it's basically attentional blindness. They can fit whatever fit into that world. It seems like it's a good idea, and then they just go on with it. It's much easier to do than to actually keep an open mind and to think about how you want to analyze and think about each problem. And I think it's very kind of uh, intoxicating to go into the framework. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, we'd like to ask um, the student who uses the pseudonym Kanga or Kanga their question as our final question. What are you two blind to? How do you compensate? Do you find that it is worth it to personally compensate through self-awareness or instead to accept a personal deficit and work with others to compensate through collaboration? Um, you know, I, I'm the I'm one of the people who's involved in this organization, Haystack, that I co-founded. And our method is collaboration by difference. So we actually have a methodology. There's 10,000 people. Our methodology is actually to try to always have somebody in a group who 
who doesn't share the assumptions of the group. We also trick ourselves. We'll have sometimes somebody, com a complete stranger, come into the group and be part of a meeting. Uh, a few weeks ago, we asked somebody who does housekeeping in the Franklin Center and the Franklin Humanities Institute to join us. Oh my goodness. If you want to know what really happens in a building, ask the housekeeper. Right. The person who's often treated as if they don't exist. She had a pretty great idea of who the nicest people in the building were, who were the most considerate people in the building, and of how the building actually functions and doesn't function. And that was one thing we talked about, but then we also talked about what we were doing and how learning works. She was phenomenal. I mean, we learned more about her, but we also learned more about ourselves and our assumptions and what it means to be at an elite university. Uh, who, which is supported by, I think, thousands. I think that's right. I, think. I don't remember how many people Duke employs. How many people is it? 30,000. 30,000 people at Duke, only a tiny percentage of which are faculty, and not a very large percentage of which are students. Right? And we have all of this supported by people who um, work very, very hard to make this available, but who often are not um, part of the conversation. So I would say I consciously use attention blindness as a methodology to help my organization be as innovative as possible. We're dedicated to informal learning in school and out of school, lifelong learning, not just college education, and to, to think about new modes of learning, uh, including for people who could never even dream to afford a Duke education. Uh, in my private life, I still stub my toe like everybody else, right? I can know all this. That's the frustrating thing about attention blindness. You can know all of this. Um, so actually, that's some, in some situations, I am hyper-vigilant. I will say to myself, wow, I'm so stressed out today, and I've got so many things. I have to be really careful driving. Uh, the, the three minutes to work, because I know that route so well, if I'm not careful, something bad could happen. So I do tend to have a secondary a consciousness about when I'm going to be most vulnerable just because of the work I do, but uh, I still stab my toe. Okay, so uh, first I, I have the opinion of myself as being open-minded, <laughs> <laughs> and I like this vision of myself, but um, you know, and I like to think of myself as somebody who cares about data, and you know, people can convince me of anything with the right data. Uh, I'm also stubborn, so I, I realize that, but I still... Um, my two biggest, I think, deficits in terms of kind of managing my life uh, are being invited to give lectures in places and email. And I think for me, both of them work in the same way. So somebody invites me to go somewhere. And in my mind, I immediately imagine the sadness that will enter and fill their lives if I reject, <laughs> if I say no. Now, of course, I'm like number 10 in the list of the people they invited, and just number 11. It's not a big deal. Very hard for me to, to imagine life this way. So I travel way too much and give too many lectures and uh, do too many things. But that's, it's very hard. I get this personal email. And you know, I really know that they probably send it to lots of other people. But it's hard, it's hard for me not to... Uh, not to feel it's, I'm special to them. Uh, I guess compliments also work on me in a very nice way. <laughs> there's, there's a very nice research, by the way, that showed that compliments really work well, even when people know you're insincere. <laughs> <laughs> so you write, you write something to somebody and you say, you know, your research just kind of brightened my day. Yeah, it's going to go well after that. Um, the other thing which I think I have a tremendous attentional blindness to, and, and the word attention is good here, is uh, the value of email. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, email is a, is a blessing and a tremendous curse. Uh, I get way too much of it. I have a very hard time figuring out how to answer all of this. Um, and, and I think two things happen in email. One is I have a very hard time not responding to email. I have people who write me very nice emails and want to have some question to ask, ask and and I have a very hard time ignoring it, but at the same time, if I keep on answering all these emails, I'll never get my work done, I'll never sleep, I'll never do all those, all those other things. And then the other thing is that I think that the way I do email uh, really interferes with my attention. So um, I think I do email way too much. Uh, sometimes I sit in meetings, 
and do email, thinking wrongly that I can do both email and pay attention to the <laughs> meeting, but uh, not able to do it. The only time I'm being called up on it is when I talk to my mother. She actually knows. She's like a sixth sense for detecting <laughs> and, and talking to her and on email at the same at the same time. But for me, that's that's a big attentional problem, and I'm kind of aware of it to some degree, but not fully aware, and for sure have not taken any steps to remedy the situation. Questions, thoughts? Well, you asked a bunch of questions yeah. in the blog. Just repeat. Yeah. So I know, that, I know that the two of you um, work with a lot of companies and help with their management. And um, based on the blog that you wrote, Professor Davidson, um, how would the two of you recommend um, to management executives um, on how to create organizations in which you can have you know, groups of people from diverse backgrounds in which they can actually see the whole picture? and not necessarily need people um, to come in from the outside and actually point those things out to them. Um, I, that, that actually is a role I'm often called in. Um, in some organizations where there aren't enough women, I'm, I'm called in, but sometimes just organizations that want to uh, get themselves out of certain kinds of patterns. And um, it may have been in your blog or in one of those students' blogs that um, there's lots of findings that people, even when they think they're going to go after someone who's totally different from, from, the, from themselves, end up replicating uh, their own biases and going for the person who's really smart. We're going to go from this to the smart person, not the diverse person, and end up hiring somebody that looks, looks and acts and shares many of the values that they do. Um, so when I'm in those situations, I often will, uh, when I'm called in specifically to do that, um, the first thing I'll do is look at the com company culture. Because uh, some cultures, some companies actually do a pretty good job of manufacturing um, diverse situations. I do most of my um, consulting is with um, technology companies, and um, often younger people in technology companies, and a lot of those already tend to have uh, probably a higher percentage. Because I'm not dealing with the CEOs, I'm usually dealing with uh, sort of middle managers, and um, often are already culturally or nationally more diverse than. Um, certainly not than Duke, but often more diverse than a Fortune 400 co company would be. So we'll often work with that, and I'll try to listen and hear what they really are asking me. Are they asking me how to have people who look more diverse, or, or are they trying to? A are they asking me, do we want more out of the box, surprising kinds of decisions? And those are really different. And people often don't know what they're asking. So I would say the first thing I try to do is really listen and then come up with activities or projects or um, suggestions that are about what thing they feel they're missing. Um, I do a lot of things that we'll do it in here, I'm sure, sometime. It's, a, it's an exercise that's often done with little tiny kids called Think, Pair, Share, where you'll ask people to write, do something for 90 seconds individually, then uh, usually write it on an index card, three things on an index card, then turn to somebody quite randomly, lots to be near them, and look at the six things and together negotiate one thing, and then I'll have them talk about the one thing they circled together and what they rejected. And that's often a better way of finding out what they're really after than having them say, oh, we want diversity or we want new ideas. Well, that's really hard to know what that means. Um, so I try to get them to commit to, it's kind of like the blogs we do in here, commit to an idea before we actually move forward from that idea. Talk about it. So, so I, I think that uh, human nature uh, is really a, a big barrier to multiple <laughs> opinions. So there was this uh, old study by Ash. Uh, he put a few people in the room, and he said, there's some lights in front of you. The, the room is perfectly dark. There's some lights in front of you. Tell me whether you think they're moving left or they're moving right. Actually, there were no lights. But if you're in a very, very dark room, after a while, your own brain starts producing some uh, <laughs> Things that look like stimulation, right? The brain doesn't deal well with no stimulation. So you see some flashes. And then people agreed whether it's right or left. Okay. Then, and they kept on talking. One person comes out, another person comes in. They keep on talking. One person comes out, another person comes in. Eventually, you have all new people. Nobody that was there in the beginning, and you ask them, did the lights move to the right or to the left? And they agreed to that first decision. And for me, this is kind of culture, right? So we have a completely ambiguous signal. In fact, there's no signal. And all of a sudden, people agree on what it is. And this agreement outlasts any of the people who participated. 
And, and this is because we all want to fit. There's kind of a demand to, to be very, very similar. Being outside the norm is incredibly difficult. And, and in the modern workplace, where you spend lots of hours with people and you go to beer, I mean, it's one thing if you hate them, right? Then you can disagree. But if you're trying to be friends and have coffee together and beer and go out and go skiing and so on, the pressures to actually socially fit are even, even higher. So the idea that we could have diverse groups that would keep on holding to diverse opinion without tremendous social pressures to succumb to that is very, very low. I think that's very tough. The second thing that is very tough is language. So I think language is a coordination mechanism, right? As a, we can decide on some acronym, so we can decide what a particular word uh, means. And the moment we decide on some terms and some usage of language, all of a sudden, it's very hard to express other opinions. It, it's a little bit like the attentional blindness, that when you have a particular word, all of a sudden, this word defines things for you. You think about life from that perspective. And for organizations to become efficient, they do invent all kinds of words. You go to any organization, and they start talking in acronym incredibly quickly because it's an efficient thing to do. So I think when you get a new group, you can have a few diverse opinions, but as the group stays together for longer, I think it's a very, it's a losing battle in, if you just leave it to human nature. My, my hope comes from something called prediction markets. So if you remember, there's something called the Iowa presidential markets. When people basically predict, they actually buy and sell options of who will be the next president. And over quite a few years, these prediction markets have done better than any poll. Now, how do these markets work? It's a bit like the stock market. You don't try to get together and sing kumbaya and agree. On the contrast, if one president's share is higher than the other, and you think that's a good reflection of life, you would not participate in the market. But if you think somebody has it wrong, now you would buy or sell a particular future of a president. And it's interesting, you know, I'm not a big fan of the stock market as the optimal thing for financial uh, outcomes. But if you think about a market for information, that's actually quite a good mechanism. Basically, it says that if we have three different options, and if we have all of these options have some, pri uh, some prices attached to them, if I think this option, these things in the market reflect the relative value, I'm not going to participate. If I think you all got it wrong, I will sell short, I will buy, I will do something that would reflect my opinion. And there's lots of mechanisms like this. There's the Hollywood Stock Exchange to try to predict uh, how much movies will gross. And uh, there's all kinds of, there's ideas for companies to promote ideas internally. But what's interesting about it, it's anonymous. And you're not trying to get the group to work together. I think every time we all get in a group and we get to decide together, the forces of group think are too many. But technology can help us to separate people, get them to, to and anonymously to fight with each other, and I think in some cases, the outcome of this fight is actually going to be uh, better. So when you think about people being diverse, I think there's, of course, what their opinions are, but there's also what environment do you put people in, and is the environment going to get people to just say the same thing after a while, or is it truly going to maintain some difference of opinions? Okay, we have three minutes left for one last question, a quick question. I think you first. So in trying to encourage a diversity of opinions, what's the power of incentives? Have there been studies, in other words, which look at <clears throat> incentivizing someone, you know, for, for example, offering a reward for pointing out a major flaw or pointing out the proverbial, you know, gorilla in the room? And do these programs work or do they pit employee against each other? You know, I would look at Wall Street. They're interested in Wall Street, but you know, so there have been a few people who bet against the housing market, but there are very few. And it's hard to know in retrospect if those were people who were particularly smart or they were just lucky. There's always some people who vote against something and it just happened to be, uh, to be like, oh, if they knew something that other people didn't know, which is also uh, seemed to be one of the cases. And I think the bubbles we see in the financial market, when you have strong people with incredible wisdom, computer models, and so on working for them, professionals, um, and tremendous incentive to bet against that. The fact that we still see bubbles tell me that it's a very tough uh, human quirk to get over. By the way, bubbles are one of the easiest things to generate in the lab. 
you bring people to the lab and they have trade some fictitious stock and very quickly it goes up and then everybody <laughs> wants it. And then at some point it just it just collapsed. You could just generate it very easily. So I think I think it's very, very tough to find out any evidence that we can actually with just incentives solve this solve this problem. And then and uh, Dan, you said something about technology. Something that I find fascinating, and I think we'll be talking about this throughout the, the course, is if you go back to two thousand and two when Jimmy Wales and uh, Larry I can't remember his last name, first invented Wikipedia. They're not paying people to contribute. It's an anonymous contribution. They thought maybe two or three hundred people would contribute. And now it's the sixth most trafficked site on the World Wide Web, and the National Archivist of America says it's more reliable than any other uh, worldwide encyclopedia. Why? Why did people want to share what they knew with other people? Or on Yelp, or on medical help, helpless. Why do people, what is it about people that makes them want to contribute? And contribute in different ways. And it's not really incentive, right? What's your incentive for com contributing to Wikipedia? We would, irrational choice economic theory would say you had to pay somebody, you had to reward somebody, you had to give them an incentive. But people do it. And that to me is kind of an interesting uh, phenomena and mystery and inspiration of our particular moment, and I hope we get to talk about that more because I think it gives us a different, uh, perplexing and fascinating kind of view of human nature to think about why we do want to be crowdsourced, why we do want to participate in some kind of knowledge sharing that might tell what we know but also help somebody else to know something. It's fascinating. What's it? One last thing about um, Wikipedia is uh, my age on Wikipedia is actually wrong. <laughs> and I tried to fix it many times, and somebody uh, makes me a year younger, and I, I, I gave up the fight. Um, and the last thing I should say is that every time I personally want an opposing opinion, I just call my mother. <laughs> Good advice for all of us.